So a couple of videos here I want to react to. First one is both these videos are out in the last 24 hours. This gentleman, uh, I've seen him on CNBC before. They call him the chart master, okay? The chart master says, it's time to postpone all buying right now. So basically stop buying stocks altogether. I want to hear what he has to say in regards to this. Like, like, like that's a big statement to say, just don't buy stocks right now. Okay, well, let's hear what he has to say. Then we'll watch this video together. This is a great year to add stocks. And so when, whenever I kind of see these videos, I like to just kind of pay attention to them and see what the rationale is. When, you know, when somebody says stop buying stocks now, don't buy stocks. Like what's your rationale behind that? Does it make sense, right? If somebody says, let's go buy stocks right now, this is a great year to be buying stocks. Like what's the rationale be behind that? And I love to kind of just see what, what people have to say. And uh, let me react to this one, kind of give my opinion. Gives with the action from Friday's terrible sell-off to yesterday's complete turnaround. And now today a resumption of a, what looks like a pretty broad-based decline. Right. In a way, it's the volatility that's the issue. And it's also every third day we get that rebound, which is to say hope is still alive. And there's nothing wrong with that. But it means you never really get the cathartic sell off. You never get the capitulatory type um, conclusion. And so and let's take the small caps. I mean, Russell Tooth has been in and out of a bear market, however you want to define that, 20%. It's not about that. It's that equities have been topping for quite some time. And we also have, and I think this is important, a bifurcated market. And the history of bifurcated markets is not good. So think about this. We have extreme strength in certain stocks, certain areas of the market. Think about how strong energy has been, materials, steel, aluminum, uh, precious metals, consumer staples, utilities, all up, up and to the right. And the exact same time we've had extreme weakness in biotech just gets worse and technology and semis uh, and retailers. And so when you have a spread like that, there is the thought that the strong stocks have it right, that energy is leading the way and that uh, the material stocks are right and the weak ones will start to bottom. But bifurcation actually ends the opposite way. The strong start to crack. We're seeing that now. Metals and mining are cracking. Energy is cracking. A lot of the steep run up in certain stables is starting to give way and the weak get worse. And so we're starting to see that kind of unfolding. I think there's more uh, downside. There's more stress ahead. And um, it's just a time to postpone most all new buying. Yeah, well, I don't really. So I somewhat agree with, with what he says there uh, in regards to kind of like the um – the, the, the difference in the market between the, the, the haves and the have-nots, right? You have certain stocks that have been doing great, the energy sector, uh, some of the material companies, those sorts of ones, right? They've been doing phenomenal. Meanwhile, over here, you got these, uh, you know, small cap growth stocks, mid cap stocks, anything like that. Devastated tech stocks even have, as a bunch have been put in that category, right? And so he's basically saying that, you know, once the material stocks and all those sorts of stocks start to have some trouble, it's going to bring down the rest of the stocks as well. Smalls, mids, tech, everything like that that's already been hurt. So I kind of agree with that for, for you know, uh, to a certain extent. The part I disagree with is this, this notion that you know, that's the way it's going to work out because it's just time and time again, I've seen over the past 14 years of me being in the market, just like time periods that it doesn't work out the way you assume it's going to work out. So you think it's going to work out that way. It doesn't, and it's like an overcomplicating uh, of the stock market essentially, right? Where you're, you're trying to like say, well, you know, these stocks are, are doing great. These stocks are doing bad, but when these stocks start doing bad, these ones are going to do even worse. And I just feel like it's an overcomplication of the stock market. At the end of the day, what I like to look at is is a stock a great buy for the next five years? Is this extremely discounted? And do I think I'm going to make a ton of money on these shares? And if I think I'm going to make a ton of money, I buy those those shares. Because at the end of the day, I can always talk myself out of buying a stock. It's very easy to talk yourself out of the market. You can you know go on all these complicated matters or talk about all the stuff that could go wrong and things like that. There's always a million things on how you can talk yourself out of stock, especially when you're in a bear market. And that's the easiest time, right? Like this message. You know, this is a very, <laughs> this is a very difficult one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, obviously, free choice. Everyone can do what they want. Oh, but too much I mean, laughing. There, is, there are some times where you can just maybe, and we do have expressions in the English, like let the dust settle, right, or just stand aside. I think that's a moment like this. It's interesting what you say about leadership, though, because definitely people have been looking to the market. There is a, the interesting part of that is, is usually when you're in bear market on the indexes, um, you know, you shouldn't let the dust settle and you usually have to be a buyer. Now, yeah, there's a different scenario. If you think the we're going to have an entire crash in the economy, it's a, a, a totally different scenario. Now, I'm not talking about a slowdown. I'm talking about a crash. I'm talking about unemployment 10% plus type thing. I'm talking about 07, 09 type crash, right? 
where the market ends up falling 50% plus by the when when all the dust does settle, right? And if you're banking on that, you're banking on a, you know, a situation that happens very few and far between. But in that type of scenario, I can understand it. But usually how it works is you go into bear market 20, 30% down, and then you start your, your, your trajectory upward. We're already down 22% plus on the NASDAQ as of recording this video right now. We'll see, obviously, what happens uh, you know, with the last few trading days here in April. But that's where we're at so far. Very, very important to understand. Okay, fine. If I stay away from you know, high <laughs> PE tech, you know, the overall market's held up fine. If I get into energy, if I get into some of those ports that you mentioned, maybe I can ride this out. What would your uh, sort of, I don't want to say advice, but the way that you look at the setups here, could th this dynamic be changing somewhat? Well, so, I mean, under the playbook, right, if you can call it that, on page one says, obviously, you go defensive. And there are people who don't have a choice, right? You are by mandate fully invested. You're running a fund. You can't hold cash. And so it's not random that Coke is doing well. It's not random that Walmart is holding up certain uh, to extent, a large extent. So the, the defensive trade is always there. Um, but then it gets to when you do have a choice, do you have to? And you were asking that just uh, the prior guest, do you have to put money into Google right here? This is actually a time, I think, where you should avoid the temptation to say, I've got to get in, I've got to do something. Sometimes sitting on your hands is really the best thing. You know, it's different. That, that's very, very tough. You know, Google, you look at that stock right now. I, I don't personally have any money invested in Google, but dang, I can say that stock's a steel deal right now. It's trading at a forward P of... 18 or so. The balance sheet's ridiculous at the company. They just authorized, I think it was a $70 billion uh, buyback. Income statement's insane. The growth is insane. You're talking about Google search. You're talking about YouTube. You're talking about Android. You're talking about their cloud business. The, you know, that's one of the most amazing companies in the world we've ever seen, right? And so to see the stock trading as cheaply as it's trading to say, you know, I'm not going to buy it because it might go lower. It's just... Uh, you know, that's just a, such a gambling game at the end of the day, which is, isn't a game I like to play. At the end of the day, I like to say, is Google a great deal? It feels it's a great deal, and it's one of the best values you can get in the market. Then you got to take advantage of that, regardless if you think Google is going to go from 2200 to 2100 or 2000 or whatever, right? If it gets cheaper, then just buy more shares, right? And as long as you're in a great financial position where you have more income than expenses each month, you're always in a position where if that stock somehow goes lower, you're, you're able to buy it. That's the most important thing when it comes to a long term investor, always having more income than you do expenses every single month. From last cycle, where for that kind of 10 year period while the Fed was doing QE and the economy was quite weak, we kept getting these um, sell offs, these dips that were so short. And then the rips would be so extreme that it was almost like if you didn't buy the day that stocks bottomed and who knows at the time, you would miss the 5% move before you knew it. Why is now different? Something I love about the stock market is the fact that I don't have to buy an entire company, right? I can buy shares in a stock. I don't have to buy the entire Tesla company, which is a trillion dollars. I don't have a flip and flapjack and trillion dollars around, right? If I want to buy a chunk of Apple stock, I don't have three trillion dollars to buy the entire Apple company, right? It's nice that I can just buy shares of the Apple Corporation, have some ownership of Apple, right? Well, the art market has been completely out of reach to the masses for the longest time. There's never been a way to essentially do that right? You would either have to have $5 million, $10 million, $20 million, $50 million to buy a great art piece, right? Well, now through Masterworks, which is today's sponsor of this video here, they've enabled us now as small investors to buy chunks of art pieces, to actually have some sort of ownership of these great art pieces without having to buy the entire thing. And when these art pieces do sell, you can get the proceeds from that. Something not a lot of people know about is the art market can appreciate greater than the stock market over time as well, especially when it comes to these fine art pieces. So if you want to skip the wait list of Masterworks, check out my page in the comment down there, click on that, sign up for that, and you'll be able to skip the wait list and check out Masterworks on a much deeper level. And it's pretty darn cool. Thank you, Masterworks, for sponsoring today's video. And back to the video. Right. And so it, it, it depends on what, whether you're in a bull or bear phase, right? So if you're in a long and protracted ascent, and we've been in, in a, it depends how many years you want to measure it, dips are counter trend moves in an ongoing uptrend. But see, the question now is, are we still in an uptrend? You know, Dow theory, and this is important, right, which goes back 100 plus years, the MSA all country transportation index, it peaked on May 10th. That's almost a year ago, meaning it's never confirmed the move since then in the rest of the global equity market, which is to say, and it's a long answer, I don't think we're in an uptrend. And so then the counter trend moves are these up moves, which should be faded. 
uh, and buying the dip is wrong. So last question, is this a time frame that people need to wait it out? Is it contingent on what the Fed does here? What kind of gets us to the end of this downtrend? Well, you bring up maybe the most salient point of all. It is about time. And so um, could it be that after the great excess of the past two years, it's been a very impressive move since the COVID low, uh, whether it's government induced or not, but it's been impressive. Is this now this stall, this churn, simply the pause that refreshes, or is it more of the, the stall before the storm we roll over? Let's say we don't know. Let's hold that aside. Either way, I would say 90% of the odds are captured in sideways or down that 10% only is that we somehow go higher from here. All right. Well, I really appreciate it. I mean, sort of. So, uh, you know, first off, Carter, I would call him a very high IQ person uh, at the end of the day. You know, uh, obviously, I'm, I'm sure he, he went to a, a great university and, uh, you know, just a smart dude in general, right? And somebody that if you needed a lot of data, you, you could you could get it from. But with that being said, um, I just don't fully agree with this kind of stance on, you know, markets tough, markets volatile. And it could go lower, so don't buy stocks. At the end of the day, man, you see great deals in the market. You got to take advantage of those deals. If they get cheaper, you buy more shares and you increase your ownership position even bigger. It's not the worst thing in the world. Um, so that's just kind of my stance. And because the thing with a, a gentleman like Carter, there, like I said, he's a very high IQ person, right? He's gonna he's gonna overcomplicate the market. He's gonna say, well, this, da, 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 da. you know. And at the end of the day, like, dude, if Google's a great deal, twenty two hundred, you buy that flipping stock. And if it happens to go down to nineteen hundred, you buy more of the stock. It's as simple as that, because I can promise you, you're never going to Carter or anybody. They're not going to be able to bought. They're not going to be able to perfectly time that and be like, oh, I got to deploy all my cash right now in Google because now's the perfect time. That's not how it works. And so, you know, you can definitely very, 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 very much uh, overcomplicate the market. All right. Let's watch this clip here. Uh, let me know what you thought about that first clip and let me know what you think about the second one in their opinion here. Sorry, and that, of course, is the, the mega cap tech earnings that started today. Bryn Talkington, you own Microsoft. You own the Qs. You worried? No, the time to be worried was, you know, at the end of last year, I actually wrote an op-ed for, for, for you guys talking about the last 10 years, the Qs have done 20% a year. You have to digest that. I think tech is gonna continue to be under pressure. I do think this year is gonna be a good year for accumulating tech names. And so I'm not adding to my position yet, but I think we'll look back a couple of years from now and say 2022 was a good accumulation year for some of these names. I think in May and June are going to be that good sweet spot. Once again, once we've gotten past some of these Fed hikes. And I've heard you before. So I, I agree with her. You know, in the stock market, it's very similar to the real estate market. You have buyer's markets and seller's markets, right? And sometimes you can have a, a market that's somewhere in between. But in, in, a, in a, a buyer's market, that's when, you know, if you're a buyer in the market, you have a great pick of deals and there's deals everywhere and you can negotiate and those sorts of things. And if it's a if it's a seller's market, that means it's a hot market. Right. And at the end of 2020 and in the beginning of 2021, it was definitely a seller's market for the stock market. If you were holding stocks and you want stocks to sell. The, the pricing you could get on those stocks was incredible, right? And so it was a great time to be a seller of stocks, not a great time to be a buyer of stocks. Right now, we've got a completely reversed market here in 2022, and this could easily continue on throughout the year, where you have so many great names. Like, I know 50 stocks off the top of my head that I would love to buy right now. It, the problem is, there's only so much money to go around, right? So you got to pick the, the best opportunities over, for your money over the next 5, 10 years. But there's deals everywhere in this market, and as a buyer, I feel like it's just like shooting fish in a barrel. Like, there's so many deals everywhere, small caps mid caps, large caps. It doesn't matter now. At, at first it was only, I had small caps to pick from then in mid caps emerge. Now it's even large caps, like even big tech, like everything's, uh, I'm just looking at deals all over the place now. And so that's the sort of market we gotten into. And so it, when you're in a, a buyer's market, you have to take advantage of that flip and flapjack in market as tough as it is with all the, the negativity and all the bad stuff. You have to take advantage of that because the future you in three years from now, five years from now will be thanking that you took advantage of that sort of year and in that sort of market because you very few and far between get those sorts of years. And if you don't take advantage of those years, you always end up regretting it. Stocks, Dan, suggests, uh, you know, such and such name is a, a quote unquote table pounder. I don't hear you saying that about these names today. Look, I think you have to, in, in the context of the broader market, you know, as, as, she, as she was talking about, you know, the, the only thing worse than, than uh, you know, buying a $10 stock and it goes to uh, $4 is it's not buying a $4 stock and it goes to $40 over the coming years. And you're like, hmm, yeah, I remember that one. Uh, I should have been buying it, but, you know, I was thought it might go to three. It's like, come on, dude. Mike. This is going to be ultimately valuations that I believe uptick 
throughout the rest of the year. I believe you look at the growth, you look at what you see from Microsoft and overall cloud. I mean, Scott, I view it still tech stocks here as oversold as I've seen in the last six years. We continue to be bullish. And I think these numbers, once we get through this Fed cycle, I do still believe they're table pounders. And I just think it's one that in a risk off market, you know, they continue to be on the outs. All right. This is a very important report uh, that doesn't get its due. Uh, the way that it used to really, or the way at least that people think about it, and maybe they should, and it's Texas Instruments, which we're showing you right now. The fact that their chips are in so many different businesses, from autos to industrials, et cetera, really, et cetera, really across uh, the spectrum. You can see that stock is down about six and a third percent. Uh, the revenues there beat. Uh, let's take a look at the EPS, which I don't see on my screen right now, but we'll take a look EPS there. But obviously the stream uh, has some questions about this. The chip space, uh, their EPS was Guidance 235 was a share. You could, you could already know that the, the street was worried about the chip space. Uh, the, as much as the chips had fallen lately, this was an area of, of, of concern. If you think the economy is slowing and that a number of, of businesses uh, across the space are, are going to have their demand go down, this is an area that you should look at, a stock like TXN. If you look at the semiconductor space in general, <laughs> dude, it's a mess. I mean, so many of those stocks are at 52 week lows or very, very close to 52 week lows. It's insane. And, um, doesn't mean it's justified. It's just that's the way that's the sort of market we're in right now. And uh, Apple has been reporting great numbers. We'll see. They continue to report great numbers, but they have been reporting great numbers in a lot of these, you know, Texas Instruments, uh, Skyworks Solutions, Qualcomm, a lot of these different companies, Cirrus Logic, um, that are big semi players. They've just been getting devastated. Supply chain, right? I mean, if you look Stock at semis right at now, you know, right now it Stock continues price. to be probably as nervous as I've seen in terms of semis in a number of years. If you look at this number, definitely going to pour gasoline on the fire in terms of you know worries around the semi sector. And I think you ultimately could see over the coming days more of a sell off here because of these numbers. Brian Belsky, um, it's the guidance that that's is, is the issue here. Their guidance was weak. Aren't you alarmed by that as bullish as you are? You have one of the highest targets on the S&P for the end of the year. And I can't remember, is it 5,300? It, it is 5,300. So just listening to all of this just reminds me that there's four types of tech stocks, right? It's the secular growers, the structural growers, the defensive growers, and then the high multiple names with not a lot of free cash flow. I think those are the names are going to continue to suffer for as much as two or three more years where the secular growers, like we're hearing from today, Microsoft and... Wow. So basically what this gentleman just said is for the next two to three years, the money losers will continue to struggle interesting comments there and one thing is is uh if a tech company continues to lose money right because you can turn it around and, and start making profits but that's a big statement particular apple amazon are gonna be the ones that kind of get us out of this the structural growers have had more problems in terms of growth more particular with respect to guidance scott but texas instruments is a defensive grower uh it pays a big dividend uh, i think it's being unjustly kind of thrown into the rest of the chips that have not been able to grade good guides and dan put it best with respect to supply Supply chains, but I think on these weakening days, this is when you want to add to those big dividend growers in tech, and you certainly want to add to the big secular growers. So, no, we maintain our longer term bullish stance on these bigger tech stocks. But I mean, in terms of the market overall, right, if this is the demand issue, and I have to read through the exact guidance and get some of the commentary of what they're saying and then listen to the conference call, of course, but if it's a demand issue, as I mentioned at the very top, as many. Uh, products and things that Texas Instruments chips are in, if they are guiding uh, to a point where the market doesn't love it, if you have a market already worried about a slowdown, don't you have a, a broader issue that I feel like in some respects you're ignoring? No, I'm not ignoring it. In fact, you know, listen, I think that we're in, I know that we're in a stock picker's market. You need to be delineating this, and you can't throw all stocks into one basket. And I do think you're going to have certain chips that do very well. And like the, most of the chips are down today. And so the market was not showing any discrimination. And so they were selling everything off. So again, I'm not ignoring it. I think guidance is going to be defensive now because you can do the supply chain blame game. The Fed's going to raise rates twice, 50 and 50. And then we'll see. I still think the second half of the year is going to be bang on earnings, and they're going to be up a lot more than people think. Before all right, so bang on earnings. Uh, Fed only raises twice. If Fed U turns, uh, I can tell you those uh, high flying tech stocks that aren't so high flying anymore, the ones that lose money uh, but have fast growth rates and things like that, they will go up much faster than Texas Instruments or anything else. Um, so, you know, but you got to kind of get a Fed U turn to, to get that sort of scenario, which could play out in the fall time. We'll see what happens with that. But, um, you know, I think, I think at the end of the day, 
it's important to understand when you listen to, to a lot of different folks kind of give opinions on the market and things like that, you can very much way overcomplicate this, and especially, especially when you're in a bear market. But at the end of the day, I think it's very important to stick to your game plan, which is, uh, you know, at least for myself, my game plan is always buy companies that I love for the next five years and call it a day. And if it drops lower, I'll buy more shares as long as the, the company fundamentals are still intact. And right now we're at a, a divergence between company fundamentals and stock prices. And stock prices are saying one thing, company fundamentals are saying the other. And there's a lot of, you know, look at Google. Like, like you know, we can just keep it simple. Like, let's just talk about big dogs. Like, Google doesn't have anything that, oh my gosh, Google's ruined. They're done. Screwed. Uh, you know, that's not the situation there. Their business is as better than it's ever been. Not just good, but it's better literally than it's ever been. And it will have the best year it's ever had in 2022. And even a better year in 2023, regardless of what happens in the overall economy. And yet that stock is just, um, you know, in, in a tough place right now. And, you you know, the, the more, I guess you can say, speculative you go, the, the more you find these stocks are just getting absolutely devastated. Um, but I like to keep it simple. Buy great companies I love for the long term. And, and that's about it. And the rest is uh, is fun, is conversation. And uh, it's, it's entertainment at the end of the day. So, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. As always, thank you, Masterworks, for sponsoring today's video. Make sure you guys check out pinned comment down there. Check out Masterworks and skip the waitlist. Much love and have a great day.